Welcome one and all to another edition of the Devo Show with Luby here on the Five Reasons Sports Network brought to you by Water Cleanup of Florida. Our weather is not exactly all over the place because it's humid and rain and heat, but that is all over the place for your home or office. It's something that can bite you in the butt and seemingly come out of nowhere unless you have someone like Water Cleanup of Florida in your corner. Once you do, it'll make everything so much easier. Like I've said so many times before, my wife and I had issues with water damage in our townhouse. And before we lost it, we gave them a call, 954-579-0356, and they made everything go away. Plus, with licensed, insured, certified contractors on staff, they made it look brand new. Literally, we ourselves, if we hadn't been there for the work, would have struggled to find where it was after the fact because they did such a great job. Just call. 954-579-0356, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Michael, Robert, George, their entire team with over six years of combined experience will make you feel at ease, make you feel comfortable, and make the work not feel like work because of how well they will handle it. 954-579-0356 or check them on their website, wcufl.com, on the socials at Water Cleanup FL. Also, Google, with well over 80 five-star reviews, Water Cleanup of Florida. If you have the schmutz, believe me, they have the guts. Uh, The Miami Dolphins have had lots of guts and not so much schmutz. Parts of the Giants game, parts of the Bills game was an entire schmutzy disaster. Um, And parts of the Broncos game, yeah, there was a little bit of schmutz throughout the season, but it's been a lot of guts. That offense is setting records in the NFL. Miami Hurricanes felt like they had a lot of guts. Until we saw a schmutzy, schmutzy, schmutzy ending this weekend against Georgia Tech. We talked about it all with the one and only John Congemi on this edition of the Diva Show with Luby right here on the Five Reasons Sports Network. On the Five Reasons. It all comes back to this. Yep. What the fuck were you thinking? (laughs) Holy Colin Kaepernick, take a knee, my friend. How is it possible that Mario Cristobal, who's already had an egregious mistake with this very same thing, what was it, 2018? He's coaching at Oregon and uh, is being touted as one of the great coaches. Uh, He goes ahead and runs the ball in a situation where he could have uh, closed out the clock just by dropping to a knee. That's all you have to do. Very simple play. Most teams can execute that uh, effectively. And instead, he hands the ball off, uh, results in a fumble, and uh, ends up being an Oregon loss. If that had happened to you once, Luby, I don't care how long ago it was, would you ever find yourself in a situation where you made that mistake again? I don't think so. I remember watching those games. What what has been my criticism of Cristobal since they hired him? Lousy game day coach. Is It's not even lousy because I'm sure, look, he Oregon won Rose Bowl, won the Pac-12, um, they won games. It wasn't like every game he's bad is he tends to make weird decisions at weird times. <laughs> and he did it count. He had Justin Herbert as his quarterback. This Justin Herbert was there and they would do some really weird shit. And it was a lot of time in close games that they were winning or should win. And it, people just assumed he learned his lesson. And I was like, when he did it last year, they lost three games down the stretch when yes. they contended for the playoffs. <laughs> like who gives a shit if he's thinking about UM? And I know his mom wasn't doing well. He's a head coach, like finish the season on a high note and fucking leave. It's he's the same dude. Like I was, I stopped. Why? First of all, the game was closer than it should have been. And that's a lot having to do with his stupid ass offenses that over uh, underachieved. The, the Canes were, you know, I mean, if you looked at it, if you're scoring in like a fight, the Canes were dominant in this game. I think they had twice the amount of yardage that Georgia Tech did. Uh, it seemed like they were stymieing Georgia Tech's running game completely. Uh, Georgia Tech's quarterback was a transfer, and uh, he hadn't really distinguished himself all that much, although at least Georgia Tech was able to pass the ball a little bit. But uh, he, he was uh, largely ineffective throughout most of that ball game. And uh, then, I mean, you have 33 seconds to go. Now, what do they give you, 35 on the – or was it 40 in college on the uh, play clock? The uh, – Late clock's going to expire. I mean, they they have no timeouts left, Georgia Tech. They can't stop the clock. All you have to do is, uh, you know, take a knee, and the the ballgame's over. Why would you do anything else? It's incredible to think that you you would actually hand the ball off in that spot. Although, Luby, think about this for a second. It didn't result in a loss, and it wasn't as catastrophic. But uh, even the great Nick Saban in his game against Texas A&M, 
Uh, he, he gets a first down, and Texas A&M uh, either has two timeouts or not enough to uh, stave off. Uh, if you just took a knee on three straight plays, that was going to be the end of the ballgame. And, and instead, uh, inexplicably, Saban's quarterback drops back and throws a swing pass that uh, falls incomplete, stops the clock once. I mean, talk about a gratuity. And they, they uh, you know, don't run any time off the clock. Now it's second down. And you're thinking they're going to take a knee on the next two plays because Saban was living on the sidelines there. Uh, and you're thinking, geez, it's a good thing that the offensive coordinator is in the booth. Otherwise, Saban might have strangled him right there on the sidelines. <laughs> and, and they actually handed the ball off while operating out of the shotgun the next two plays as well. And it ended up there were seven seconds to go in the game on a fourth down play. And uh, Saban uh, decided he was going to have his quarterback run around for a couple of seconds and then fire a pass. And the time expired while the ball is in the air. Now, A&M never got the ball back, so uh, that, that was a big differential. But uh, they could have just as easily fumbled in that spot and left A&M uh, with one chance at salvation, much like uh, happened in the Georgia Tech game. Now, as inexcusable as it is to uh, do uh, the uh, uh, running play and then the handoff that that Cristobal uh, went ahead, I, I guess it had its seal of approval on this. Uh, you, you would have thought, is he on the headset at all with the offensive yeah, coordinator? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. He's highly involved, especially in the offense. I, oh, wouldn't you have cut the line at that point uh, and, and not even allowed the offensive coordinator to speak? And, and then, of course, uh, they give up two big pass plays after that and lose the ball game. I, I, I had turned away from the game thinking it was in the bag. I thought it was done. I mean, whatever domination they were, UM was down going into the fourth quarter. Like, they didn't dominate that game. I, I know the stats may have said something from you looking at it after the fact. I watched the game. They didn't dominate that game in any way. Uh, everything I told you, M fans, for getting excited for beating fucking Bethune Cookman, just wait for the ACC. They look like shit in that game. Uh, <laughs> defensively, they were strong defensively, so I'll give them credit. Their offense wasn't good. Like they no. can move the ball in the twenties. I don't give a shit. They weren't uh, able a to- bunch of picks by uh, Van Dyke in this game. Yes, yeah, three versus yeah. Uh, Georgia Tech's bad. Georgia Tech's one of the worst teams in the ACC. Like, yes, uh, and it was closer in the end, but they had the win. And and this is Chris Ball. He overthinks it, you know. And that's what's yeah. crazy about McDaniel at times is. This offense is spectacular, and he gets sometimes he gets so into it, into the freaking weeds of it, that he someone should yank it back. Hold on, just run the fucking ball. You know, there are certain times when like these mad geniuses, Mike Mark used to do it all the time, and it's what was his undoing is it's like they get so into the genius label that sometimes you just need to be a stupid schmank, like you and Andy say. Sometimes you need to be the eight year old that knew the game this way since he's fucking eight. Like you don't always have yeah. to be a genius. Start thinking Newt Rockney, right? Instead of uh, going for the spectacular, right, look, it's it has to be tempting. Uh, you have Tyree Kill out there, and Jalen Waddle was uh, in the game yesterday and was effective. Uh, you have all these other uh, guys that, that can make things happen, and you actually have like a great running attack uh, behind an offensive line that was supposed to be suspect and actually has also been doing a very good job. But 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 the bonehead play of the day definitely goes to Mario Cristobal. People were calling for his head and his firing, and that's not going to happen. But but how do you have a guy that's an eight million dollar decision maker? If you're paying a guy $8 million a year in any business, I don't care what it is, to make decisions, should that guy and that at least be above uh, handing the ball off in that spot when, when that mathematically, I mean, uh, that these guys not take any kind of mathematical uh, courses when they were in school themselves? Mario Cristobal, you, you have 33 seconds on the clock and you can waste 35 of them without taking another play or, or running another play. Ball game over. I mean, they should be in celebration mode at that point. The victory formation, uh, you know, was called on for a reason because uh, you're you're essentially lighting up a cigar like you were Red Hour back there. You're sending in Henry Finkel into the ball game. <laughs> saying, hey, Hank, see if you can make a bucket, huh? <laughs> Game's over. Let's bring him on here because uh, th- th- this is uh, going to be a fun one. There he is, man. He's down here. He's he's done college football for years. Uh, brought to you by Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill, the handsome one himself, uh, and a great distinction for the program. It's the Pigskin Playbook with the great John Kinjemi. John, how are you, my friend? I'm doing great, guys. Uh, I was just listening to the uh, the banter going back and forth about UM and, and Nick Saban and Mike McDaniel, and um, I, I think you're pretty much right on all accounts. Um, the Miami thing was bizarre. Not I, full disclosure, didn't watch a play of the game and didn't need to, uh, thinking that Miami's three touchdowns, two and a half touchdowns better than Georgia Tech on yes. their worst day. Um, but but it comes down to a decision on the sidelines that 
even if you're the most inept head coach <laughs> that ever Gary walked the sidelines, yeah. <laughs> you have to have someone else with a, with an adult outlook on the play clock and the time remaining. And you have a veteran quarterback that should have looked at the sidelines and goes, what are you guys doing? <laughs> I'm going to just kneel on the ball. Yeah, yeah you should just do it, yeah. You know, I'm going to take it in my own. I'm going to leave you of the mistakes that you could potentially make and I'll handle it. You guys shut up. I got it. And you on the football. I I, I don't, I don't understand. And when, when you watched it, even, even when I watched the replays, I said, well, okay, they got what two plays at, 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 there's no way they can, they can score. Sure. So yeah. now it goes back to the defensive side going, get whatever it. happened to the, the, the mantra of stay as deep as the deepest yeah. in prevent, like no one yes. gets behind us. No, no one's going to get behind us, but yet you have two UM players in those awful black uniforms trailing <laughs> a, a Georgia. What, what was that player, by the way? Yeah. A Georgia tech player. Just wear your normal orange at home and your white pants <laughs> and go out and, and beat them by 35. Man, I, get it. I, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. And it must be a real kick between the legs that you got to pay that guy $8 million to make no decision. Just stand there and go, oh, he didn't do anything. <laughs> well, and then beyond that, I mean, uh, Mar- Mario is not one to uh, start pointing fingers at players. Uh, okay. But, uh, I mean, he, he didn't really bear – full responsibility for that. And his press conference, he, he really seemed lost where uh, he said, well, I'm not exactly sure what happened there. Well, that's, like, what well, I, that's the, yeah. that's the bad part. You're the, you're the guy. It's, it's your fault. Yeah. Yep. Like you're on the headset. I, you know, I heard you guys talking about, I mean, he's got the defense coordinator. He's got the offense coordinator. All he has to do is hit a button. He's got both of them. So, you know, I don't, I don't, I just, that's what I wonder. We, we look, <laughs> We, the, the priest should have uh, intervened. That's anybody. Right. Yeah, the priest yeah. should have went out on the field as the 12th like, man <laughs> and at least got a penalty a fight, just to calm everybody down. That's the thing. Yeah. Well, that, but like, that's it. Like, we a lot, often judge coaches, but there are certain decisions that you never forget. You know, the Seahawks, to this day, Marshawn Lynch gives Pete Carroll crap. Like, but we've always wondered, look, how much, yes, the coach is the head coach, but a lot of the time when you have a strong OC, strong DC, you let them do their thing, you know. Um, the Atlanta Falcons against the Patriots. Shanahan was not the head coach, but a lot of the time Dan Quinn let him do his thing. But like you've been there on the sidelines, high school, college, even in the pros. Like when the the head coach is sitting there and it's a dumb decision and he has full power, isn't it incumbent upon them to say, no, no. You know, like I feel like a lot of time they sit out and sometimes it's like, hello, well, it's your job on the line. Like, like I said, I didn't watch the whole game. So I, <laughs> I didn't watch the fourth. I didn't, I didn't get the vibe of how it was going down. And I don't even know if they had timeouts left, but if they had a timeout left, it makes it even worse because all you had to do, if you have all this indecision and confusion about what did Miami make a first down or was it a, not a first down when, when they were trying to, Run out the clock. Call timeout. Yeah. Just call timeout. Now, like again, I, I'm not sure if they had one, but if they did, it makes it worse. Because I, I all say, you have to I want to say that they did. I, I'm thinking they did because uh, all you have to do is call timeout, bring your team over to the side, count, use your fingers and toes, and go. Okay, <laughs> we have so much time on the clock. Yeah. Let's just take a knee. And so what if we give them three seconds left on the clock or whatever it might have been? It's better than what than running than exposing yourself to a potential turnover. And that's what you do when you run the football or throw it. Joe Pisarchik is off the hook. <clears throat> that was uh, yeah. had two timeouts. Yeah. Okay. Miami so that, that makes it even worse because you could have taken a timeout, no panic. And let's figured talk, it out. Let's talk about it. Let's and they even one of the hype guys that runs around the sidelines, somebody's got to know a little analytics, right? Because everybody's got three analytics people on the team now. Right. So when you call timeout, you consult. What, what's the deal? What, what's the situation? Okay, how much what power do we, does the quarterback? Do do? Van Dyke, he's, he's like 23, I think. He ultimately <laughs> has all the power because he's, he's the guy on the field. He's on the field. 
Yeah. He's, he's on the field. Even if he doesn't want to do the knee, I'm saying. Like, let's say, okay. You oh, know, yeah. He could call timeout, too. And he at least coach. Absolutely. What the fuck? You know doing? what? These guys don't know what they're doing. I'm going to turn to the ref, call timeout, walk over. But what the hell are you guys doing? <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I, it's inexplicable, I, especially since it's happened to him before. I mean, uh, you know, you, you would have to think that, uh, you know, that, that 2018 game in Oregon hit him so hard and he faced so much criticism for it that uh, you, you would tell yourself, hey, I, I'm ne- well, you know, I've been married three times too, John. So, you know, we, we've all made mistakes and repeated them. But uh, everybody makes yeah. mistakes. But you would think that there, were, there there's so many people, you know, we, what we talked about the head coach. We talked about analytics. We talked about the quarterback. Even even someone, you know, uh, one, of the, Ganke co- should have called one of the, the coordinators. Well, yeah. yeah, one of the coordinators. Don Bailey Jr. should have Don pulled Bailey himself have... out of the out of the box onto the field. He must have fallen off the roof of the uh, stadium there uh, after uh, seeing that happen. And then, of course, I mean, just, just the ultimate slap in the face uh, when, when they score on two plays. Uh, yeah, before the game, I was watching a little ACC network, which. I, I had to figure is being run by ESPN since it Stephen is. A. Smith was a big presence there on the uh, on the pregame show, and uh, Stephen A. was uh, they asked him for I guess he does a listing on his regular show uh, top five this top five that so so they asked him the uh, top five players and uh, or he listed the top five players in UM history, which uh, if you're going to have a top five players in UM history, can you leave Jerome Brown off of that list? I know they're. You have to draw the line somewhere, and there are a lot of great players, and it wasn't like any of the players that he mentioned were a disgrace. He had, like, uh, Sean Taylor, Ed Reed, Ray Lewis, uh, and uh, Michael Irvin. I forget who uh, the uh, fifth one was, but, uh, you know, it wasn't somebody who said, oh, my God, yeah, what are you, crazy, Stephen A.? But, yeah, but, but how do you have a list that, that doesn't have Jerome Brown, which uh, if you, uh, you know, tracked it through UM historians, John, is it a fair statement that that people would come up with a consensus that that Jerome Brown might have been the greatest UM player of all time? Uh, you know that that's a that's a tough one for me anyway because I don't know the Jim way he was Kelly, revered. Was, I mean, it's, was Jim it's, Kelly's name mentioned. Jim Kelly, uh, you know, they they barely touched on that. He didn't name uh, any quarterbacks. I, I, I would think, you know, are we Jim just Kelly, saying? Are we just saying in their UM career or just in their career? Uh, that's overall? what I'm figuring. Yeah, UM career, uh, college career. I mean, uh, that would have been the criteria that that I would have, you know, considered. What about uh, Johnson, the receiver? Was he was he on that list? No, no. I mean, no. Uh, you know, he, uh, Edrin, Edrin James. No, on no. That list? Edrin no. James didn't make it. None of the okay. uh, running backs that they had. Uh, Chuck I, Foreman. I, I don't. I don't know. Then I, maybe I, I. I don't know how Stephen A. came up with his list, but it's a tough. It's a tough task because you've got so many players that could be potentially on that list. Yeah, but um, you know, like I said, it was hard to argue with any of the guys he included. Yeah, uh, you know, because uh, there were so many guys you were going to have to exclude anyway in the top five. But but I think that one catapulted itself. Naturally, I was thinking, uh, you know, after that game of the worst five losses in hurricane wow. history. And, and there have been some spectacular, just circus like losses uh, with this team. I mean, you got uh, the Krenzel game against Ohio State when, uh, you know, you had the Terry Porter call at the end. Hideous loss. Uh, you had the Flutie pass play, which. This was sort of, uh, you know, somewhat reminiscent of, although uh, that game, the flow at least, was, was uh, you know, different. And, and, and you sense that maybe Boston College, what was in there with a the shot. Uh, Frank Reich with the comeback, uh, Maryland in the second half when they were down like 35 to 3 yeah. or whatever it was at halftime or 35 points at halftime. Penn State Fiesta Ball with the six picks by Vinny T, you know, including uh, Giftopolis. But. I, you know, the importance of this game wasn't as significant, but, but wouldn't you have to put this right at the top? Yeah, I mean, you can't blow a game like that. Yeah, that that it's you're you're right, you, especially because this could mean not getting in the ACC championship. I mean, you, you figure, OK, you got one loss, but now the game against North Carolina holds so much significance and you're going on the road uh, with your tail between your legs. You know, this, this is now this will be a job for Mario Cristobal to get his team to shake this off and see if it lingers or not. You know, I, I'm, I'm interested to watch them play because, you know, is it one of those games that they come out and they shake it off and they're, they're right back and trying to hit on all cylinders? Or does this loss linger uh, when something happens in the game, some adversity hits and, and they don't handle it well? That, that'll be interesting to watch. Kind of, you know, feeling you have uh... – 
you know, I, I don't know if this is as relatable. Well, it wouldn't be relatable to you because uh, you, you don't, you know, swing in this direction here. Uh, but uh, it, it, when you leave the track and you realize that you're you're, you're just a fucking lifetime loser, <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to your car, and then it doesn't start. You know, on top of that, and then and now you're having to call AAA, and then you realize your card has expired. Uh, you know, where, where you, you can't feel any lower. You you, you just want to impale yourself to a fence and hope that some guy comes steamrolling right at you with a, uh, you know, an 18 wheeler and, and puts you out of your misery. <laughs> I can relate. I can relate to that somewhat in, in golfing terms. When you shoot yes. a horrible score and you go to your car and your car automatically opens because your keys are in your golf bag, <laughs> which you're slamming in the trunk of your car. And then you close the car and your, 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 your car locks because you don't have the keys. And then you kick your car and you break your toe. I, I know the feeling. No, 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 no. That, that's, that's how you would have to uh, leave the, that game uh, for sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there weren't that many people even left in the stands then to see this horror that uh, took place after that. All right, let's uh, go through some other college football uh, in the meantime, and then we'll get into the pros here. A good win by the Dolphins yesterday, although uh, Luby uh, critical again of uh, Mike McDaniel under the don't get cute uh, premise that, that we often profess here on the show. Um, you know, and, and you're looking at that one play. It was a 14-point turnaround. Uh, Dolphins yes. going in for a score. Uh, Giants end up scoring. They make it 14-10, and you thought, well, eh. you know, the, the, the uh, offense is just unstoppable. And, and I, I don't think that they're really going to be threatened in this game. And ultimately, they weren't. But uh, uh, elsewhere around college football, we, we mentioned that uh, Nick Saban thing. Uh, it, it didn't cost him the game. What was one of the strangest things. Now, there was some debate, as you suggested, John, that uh, they, they weren't sure maybe on the field if they had gotten the first down. I think that might have been a reason that they threw a pass play. Uh, but what, with like a minute and 30 to go, I think A&M uh, either had one or two timeouts left, but not enough to stave off the clock running out if uh, just Alabama right. had just taken four knees or three knees. And uh, you know, to throw a pass in that spot is even more outrageous. Now, I, I, my bet was, and I wish I had been able to access in-game betting, because uh, I was wondering if the on-field reporter who gets one question with Nick Saban, <laughs> and I have to say, they, they've stepped it up. An incredible number of just absolutely outstanding-looking babes are now doing sideline reporting and, and and many of them are actually very good at it, you know, right. but, but, but again, uh, did you ever have to run out in the field and, uh, you know, no. ask a question to Nick Saban? No, I didn't, but I was, you're a very confident guy though. I mean, uh, I don't know that that would have, you know, shaken you up. Or, I was any... there the night I was doing the uh, uh, ESPN radio for an opener. I think it was Alabama Louisville in Orlando when Maria Taylor was doing the sidelines Oh yeah, wow. uh, for the game. And I was there in the bowels of the stadium when she was just bawling, uh, you know, so upset that Nick kind of, cause it was the, oh, it was the time addressed. where the two quarterbacks, I think it was Jalen Hurts and Tua or, you know, who yeah. was going to play, who didn't play. And uh, I think Nick said he'd already answered that question or why would you ask a question like that or something like, you know, yes. to the effect of that. So yeah, it wasn't, wasn't pretty. So I, I would have some trepidation if I was one of the sideline reporters, not knowing what to ask or when to ask it. Or just, you know, kind of, okay, I'm going to ask it anyway and see what he says. Why not? Uh, it's kind of like our, our friend Tom Rinaldi when he used to interview Tiger Woods. And, uh, you know, Woods would shoot an 83. And, uh, you know, Tom had a, kind of an exclusive with Tiger. He was one of the few guys, if uh, maybe the only guy that uh, Tiger would talk to. And uh, he would, he would you know, very sincerely look uh, right into Tiger's eyes and say, Tiger, what positives did you take away from today's round? <laughs> Your putting, uh, you know, from 16 on was uh, meticulous, uh, you know. And, and you're like, what are you talking about? The guy just ballooned up to an 83, <laughs> lost the tournament. Uh, you know, so, so I'm thinking, uh, is this reporter actually going to say, hey, Nick, what happened there at the end? What what the hell were you thinking? Right. But, uh, no, it was uh, the usual, uh, you know, stroke job of Nick Saban. Uh, oh, what a wonderful coaching job you did there, Nick, to beat uh, Jimbo Fisher, who uh, Luby has said has somehow, I mean, has he gone MAGA Republican? He, <laughs> He's gone totally conservative. Was he not more of a gambler when he was coaching at Florida State? Yeah, didn't, absolutely. Didn't that help his uh, whole legacy be built in the first place? I and think it, so. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. And he has the athletes. He has the talent to do it. I mean, even though you know the quarterback change for Texas A and M um, with the guy they started with the season. Now they have Johnson in. Um, I, I would think he would have been more of the riverboat gambler. And sometimes guys they make their name that way and then all of a sudden they get there and they kind of change their dna 
which, you know, at some point you still have to have some of that trickery to be able to keep your team on the edge. You know, we're going to, we get the ball in this hash, this situation, we're going to run this play, you know, in the NFL, for example, we saw two double reverse passes, the exact same play Detroit runs it early in the, in the game, uh, early in the day at the one o'clock hour. Uh, great call by Ben Johnson, their offensive coordinator. They score a touchdown, easy touchdown. You go to Sunday night football and San Francisco dials up the exact same play. And uh, I think it was after the game, reading the, uh, the, the notes coming out from the game, that they saw that play in, in the Detroit game. You know, and all of a sudden it was like Shanahan said, I knew it was going to work when we called it. We had it in our game plan, and it gave me confidence That's to, to call it in the game. So it, it's all about you have to have some of those plays in there just to keep your team on edge. But knowing when the when you're when you're on offense and you're in that situation, it's sudden change. We just got to turn over the balls in the plus territory on the right hash. We're running this play. Yeah. We've repped it all week. Then your coach doesn't call it. You kind of lose confidence. So sure. yeah. I, it plays in the psyche of a team for sure sometimes. All right, let's uh, take a look at some of the other games on the uh, college slate there. Uh, UM just an absolute travesty uh, in losing to Georgia Tech. And uh, as you said, uh, John, possibly losing a shot at uh, playing for the uh, ACC championship. Uh, LSU and Mizzou, I, I took a tough beat on that one. It was uh, one of the few games that I lost in my uh, straight-up bookmaking ventures with my buddy. Uh, Francesco uh, had Missouri. A lot of the wise guys like Missouri in that game. Uh, some of the steam uh, before the game kicked off uh, started to uh, sort of drift towards LSU as uh, being capable of covering. I think it was a four and a half or a five and a half point spread. Uh, Missouri's in a position there. I mean, at, at the very worst, if you had Missouri, you were going to win this game. Yeah, you're not leading. They have the ball, and, uh, you know, they're, they're driving for what, what potentially, I guess, uh, you know, it could have been, uh, I don't know if it was going to be, yeah, I guess it would have been a winning score. Uh, they, they cough it up, and uh, then somehow they, they get the ball back, and, and the only thing that could beat you is a pick six at the end of the ball game. Yep. And uh, sure enough, from, like, their own three-yard line, a guy throws a little sideline pass, and it's picked off, and you're thinking, please, just fall down, do anything, take a <laughs> knee, take a knee. That, I was right. to take a knee a couple of times uh, over the weekend. In fact, that was the theme of the weekend, John. Take a knee. Take a fucking knee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the guy rolls into the end zone, and uh, LSU uh, covers that uh, point spread. And then um, Oklahoma-Texas was a, was a very exciting game. That was a great game. Great. And then at the very end, when it looked like Texas had the thing under control, uh, you, you had uh, Oklahoma bounce back and score late uh, yep. and put themselves in a situation where all of a sudden, you know, they're under consideration as one of the nation's best teams. Yeah, those were two fun games uh, to watch as a fan. Maybe not if you had a vesting interest in the games, but uh, it was uh, LSU and their quarterback Daniels really stole the show there at the end of the game not only with his arm, but with his legs. He, he ran for 130 yards and threw for almost, you know, 260 yards. So he kind of took over. And it looked like he, he was going to not be available. It looked like he was injured late in that game, but came back and, and uh, made the plays he had to and put LSU in position to win. And then that Texas game, yeah, you're right. When Texas goes down and they kick the field goal, you're thinking, wow, you know, this, this is going to be a – Herculean task for Oklahoma to, to get in scoring position and score, you know, a touchdown to win. They go right down the field. And uh, it was, it was amazing the way that the, uh, th that finish of the game, the great pass in the corner of the end zone, but they, it, I was amazed at the ease. It only took them like three or four plays to get into the red zone with not that much time left on the clock. So, you know, hats off to Oklahoma. They did a, a, a great job in, in the rivalry game. Yeah, Red River uh, rivalry. That that, that was uh, very exciting stuff to uh, kick off the day. Uh, uh, Louisville. I mean, uh, are we overlooking Louisville? Or, you know, and uh, unfortunately, uh, John, your high praise for Syracuse uh, no longer is merited after they got crushed by North Carolina. Another team, uh, North Carolina, if I'm not mistaken, are they not unbeaten? And and that's yeah. next up for the Hurricanes, which that's the ne yeah, that's next favorable. up. That's next up for them, and that's why I'm saying that game meant so much to Miami. Because you go in there undefeated and you feel like, you know, you might be the, the king of the, of the coastal and, and be able to take some control. And 
wow, now you have to win the game. You know, you have to win the game. You, you can't depend on anybody else beating North Carolina because you have that shot. But, you know, one more loss, and you know, now you're looking from way behind in, in the ACC. And, and was a, Notre yeah, Dame, yeah. I mean, they played a, a very emotional game against Ohio State at home a couple yep. weeks ago. They line up with 10 players on the goal line, two plays in a row. Yes. end up surrendering the touchdown. Then they go to Duke and they go, well, it's Duke. We're going to, you know, we're going to roll these guys. They don't understand that Duke's actually oh, yeah. trying to play football the last 10 years. And, yeah. and they're, they're good. And they have athletes. And they, they bring them right down to the wire. So you play two kind of different emotional games. And now you go to Louisville and Louisville's got athletes. I mean, yeah. Louisville and, and the atmosphere was electric in that building. It was great. So, you know, that was tough to overcome. So you get beat, you know, you, you, you've got a good team, but three weeks in a row of, of getting, you know, trying to find reserve to get a W and it just doesn't happen. And um, I, I'm sure a lot of people love to see Notre Dame lose. I, I think it's always good for college football when they're relevant because it's, it's nice to see. Uh, but, um, you know, it was one of those weeks where, I just thought Louisville was the better team start to finish. Oh, they, they, they badly outplayed, I thought, uh, in that game, Notre Dame uh, throughout. Um, you know, I, I wanted to be impressed though, with Marcus Freeman just because, uh, you know, hearing him speak when he got the job and then uh, even when he experienced some turmoil there the first year on the job, I, I thought he did a good job uh, kind of keeping things together. Seems like a very humble, uh, disciplined sort of guy that, uh, you know, you, you can find yourself as much as I despise Notre Dame. I mean, I, I even root for touchdown Jesus to fall off the, <laughs> you know, the wall there and, uh, you know, come crashing down to the uh, campus floor. But, uh, you know, and, and I found myself, you know, kind of thinking, hey, I, I, I can get behind this guy a little bit. Uh, you know, I, I like his character. But every time I see him after a game, win or lose, I mean, it appears like he, he's been detached from the ball game and, you know, got maybe Louisville's just a, a better team because they really they really did toy with Notre Dame in this contest. Yeah, it looked like it looked like Notre Dame. If you look at all three of those games in the last three weeks, it looked like Notre Dame at home matched up toe to toe with Ohio State. And that, that game could have yeah. went either way. Right. And, and Ohio sloppy State's stuff. One of the, yeah. Sure. Ohio State's one of the better teams in the country. Then they go to Duke, and they don't look like that team. They look like they played a little bit down to the, you know, the the inaccuracies of the game. You know, it wasn't a clean game by any stretch, and they just went back and forth, you know, with love taps, love taps, until they finally made a play to take over the game. Louisville, same way. Louisville was playing at a level like uh, Ohio State, and Notre Dame played down to a uh, level that, you know, we we could roll our golden helmets out on the field and we're going to win. Yeah, and it you know just didn't happen. Six and zero oh, uh, for Louisville and uh, yeah. very impressive uh, in this victory. Uh, and, and really, you know, we're, we're pretty much doing a number on Notre Dame throughout most of the ball game. Uh, two games into the season, I thought Sam Hartman was a Heisman Trophy uh, possibility, and that uh, you know because he plays for Notre Dame would uh, get uh, an overwhelming amount of consideration uh, in that spot. I, I don't know. The committee uh, seems to be reluctant. To, what, have they only done it once with Archie Griffin, right? Uh, back right. to back years uh, to win the Heisman. E even when there have been guys, uh, I, I guess Tim Tebow, uh, you know, could have been uh, easily a double Heisman Trophy winner. But uh, yeah, and, 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 you know, so I thought maybe uh, there was a shot there with Hartman because uh, there would be a reluctance to give it two years in a row to Caleb Williams, who, uh, you know, he, he, he may have to, you know, do more to win that award a second time to overcome his own team's defense than uh, anything he's doing offensively because uh, he got off to a slow start in this game against, uh, what was it, Arizona? Arizona. And Arizona, yeah. Arizona, Arizona, you know, that that was another coach that received a lot of criticism because uh, if you have a chance to be like a, a highly ranked team and, and you're just a bunch of unranked schmanks, um, don't you have to go for the jugular a little bit? Uh, can, can you play conservatively in those spots? Uh, and, and how would you feel about, I mean, they score a touchdown in overtime and that was the first overtime. And I, I guess that uh, put them in a position to kick the extra point and, and tie the game and send it to a second overtime. Well, would you do that or just say, hey, wait a minute, man. Let's take one shot and win the game right here because uh, we, we don't want to hang in there any longer with these guys. Uh, let, let's just win or lose right here. But we have nothing to lose. Uh, we weren't expected to even be in this game. And 
Uh, you know, he was getting some criticism for just not going for two there. It all depends on the confidence you have in your two point play that you practiced all week, you know, over and over again. Um, I would say in the course of a game, sometimes underdogs and 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 coaches that are coaching that team, when they get a lead, they all of a sudden say, "Okay, now let's just let's let's slow it down a little bit. Let's try to drain the clock. Let's make this game, you know, a couple more possession game." But they forget to realize that that team's really good that you all of a sudden have a touchdown or 10 point lead. And the reason why they were favored by 21 in the game is because they're supposed to beat you, you know, beat you pretty bad. So it's tough to hang on to that. You you almost have to keep it going. You almost have to, you know, I'll double down, I'll press, let this keep it going. Let's just play the way we're playing. And if we lose that way, at least I could say, you know what, we rolled the dice. We gave it all we got. We're, we're, We're all in. Right. So, when, when you come into that two-point situation, if, if you feel like you've executed that play, you, you've got a good one dialed up, you've got a good one called, you want to be able to do it and you want to end the game there. But something in the back of your mind saying, let's just extend this game as long as we can and see if there's somehow that they're going to make a mistake. Well, most of the time you never get to that chance because the better team finds a way to make that play and usually comes off the field victorious. Well, and uh, that's what ended up happening as uh, eventually uh, UNC in the second overtime uh, ended up uh, getting the score they needed to uh, win the ball game, and and they dodge a a major uh, upset there. Uh, Third week in a row that they've won a ball game and dropped in the polls. Uh, Meanwhile, at the top, and we were saying that uh, Georgia had uh, handpicked their opponents pretty much uh, the way that uh, Canelo Alvarez does at some (laughs) German graveyard, but uh, they were supposed to be uh, tested uh, in this ballgame against Kentucky. Kentucky uh, was coming in with some credentials, and, uh, you know, it's interesting because, you know, people are going, oh, geez, you know, I I wouldn't lay 20 points with this team right now. And you're thinking, when are they going to distinguish themselves uh, as a team that, that hasn't lost and, like, what going back uh, through you know twenty twenty one or it was like their last loss, uh, I, and and they put up like fifty points and, and started to look like uh, the champions that they are. Uh, did that convince you that uh, you know maybe uh, people were getting a little bit of a misread with Georgia through the first few games and, and that they really are, in spite of losing eleven guys to the draft off of last year's team, that they really are the premium team in college football again. I think they are. I think they are. Uh, you know, it probably brought them closer back to the pack, the way they had played and started the season. But when you see them put it all together against the team that, you know, coming into the game, Kentucky was highly rated, uh, well-coached football team, big physical offense and defensive lines. Uh, Georgia dominated the game from start to finish. It wasn't close. And it tells you that when they put it all together, you're going to have to play better than you think to stay in the game yep. because they're going to continue to score. They're going to be stifling on defense. They've got good special teams and they're well coached and they're not afraid to roll the dice. They're not afraid to dial that trick play up when they want to on offense. And right now, I think the young quarterback's getting more and more confidence knowing that, man, this is pretty fun playing at Georgia. Uh, I got a lot of athletes around me. I got a solid running game. Um, I may get yelled at a little bit, but so what? We're we're winning, and uh, and and it's 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 a fun environment to play in. When you haven't when you haven't experienced a loss, I guess in two years, um, do you think you're going to lose? No, you, you just, it's the next opponent, next next color up, and you know it's a nameless opponent, and you kind of just keep going. It, it's all about us. It's about how we play, and it's a lot about how I feel about the Miami Dolphins. I don't really think that they care about who they play. It's all about them. Yeah. And, and if we play up to our standard, I don't think anybody, especially at home, I don't think anybody is going to stop them on offense uh, under 21, 28 points. I guess uh, too, uh, you know, when you're looking at the top teams, uh, you have to mention Michigan who uh, went uh, unchallenged through their first uh, four games uh, in spite of the uh, three game suspension with Harbon and they played Rutgers who, yeah, you know, has some credibility under Greg Schiano, but uh, isn't quite ready to step in there with the big heavyweights and and uh, you know managed to come away victorious. Uh, and, and they uh, also were were involved in a big blowout uh, in their game. So uh, the top teams uh, kind of remained intact. 
Uh, Alabama, a lot of people were uh, talking about, uh, you know, making some kind of uh, comeback into the picture for the title, although I, I didn't really see that in, in their game against uh, Texas A&M. Uh, a little suspect in a, in a lot of spots that they haven't been uh, in previous years. And and uh, Georgia, once again, uh, sitting there atop the rankings. And, and as you said, John, looking very much like uh, they could well be again the uh, best team in college football. All right, we want to get into this Dolphin game, but uh, before that, I've been seeing a lot of steam about Jimmy Johnson's big chill and, and the people that are having fun there. Uh, they have the uh, stadium seating. And uh, are, are you not going to jog down there tonight? Is it not true that uh, – is it both Larry Calvano and your brother Dominic that are huge Raider fans? They are huge Raider fans. That's probably why I'm not going down there tonight, but I would go on any other day down to Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill. I, I think it'll be crazy down there with um, uh, the, the home crowd uh, that actually own, own the place will be, you know, standing on chairs and, and uh, rooting for the Raiders to win tonight. But uh, it should be awesome. And every weekend down at the Big Chill during football season, you have the sports bar to kind of take in, the, you know, your, your local team if you want or team around the country. They have so many, you know, flat screen TVs. Just take a look and and uh, we're in any direction and you can find your team on the wall and, and then maybe go outside to the Tiki bar and hang out for uh, just a, a, a great dinner and, and cocktail and take all the views of the Bayside that you can at Jimmy Johnson's because it's a spectacular place, great food, great service, and um, somewhere we can just go watch a game or just relax uh, and, and kind of go with your friends and, and have, have a drink and, and enjoy the, all the views uh, down on the Bayside. It's kind of funny because uh, we lost uh, Luby here from the picture, so we're assuming that everything is still a go. Uh, Maybe Luby went down. The Maybe Luby went down to Jimmy. Jimmy well, well did, did you see the face that was frozen on the screen? Did, did you also get that, uh, John? Because uh, Luby's face was frozen uh, in a position that uh, <laughs> you could you could have sworn that uh, Florida State had done something <laughs> as dumb as uh, Mario Cristobal did uh, in managing to lose a game that and literally snatching defeat from the jaws of uh, victory there. Uh, 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 you know, a little nervous, too, uh, about, uh, you know, bringing Mike Mayo down there because he, he always has to have something to say, John. Always like, I, I don't know, is he going to, like, go to your brother in the kitchen and, you know, say, hey, you know, you could have used a, a little, pinch, little more, more salt. pinch more salt on that grouper. And you're like, that, I, that was the most delicious piece of fish I've ever seen anybody, and you consumed it in seconds. How could you possibly have a criticism? But, uh I can't wait. I, I was thinking about it even as I was getting ready for the show today to uh, to see uh, Mike Mayo consuming the Italian fisherman pizza. I don't I, I, you're, you're you know, you're, you're more of a diet conscious, uh, you know, because obviously you, you've I don't maintained know. I li- I, I, some semblance I like of fitness. That. Yeah, I'll dive in. Yeah, I'll dive in for sure. Okay. Uh, you right. know what? I would if I were you, I would be right beside my brother when Mike Mayo does say that, because you'll go to the floor with the response you <laughs> hear from my brother. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, Mayo, you know, he, he's going to have to temper himself a little bit uh, and, and maybe, um, you know, make some better decisions, uh, much like uh, Mario Cristobal. Um, you know, there was a guy that we ran into that uh, would have strangled him, uh, a, a guy named Reno at the Heritage Restaurant, who uh, yeah. oddly <laughs> is going to become our hockey expert, courtesy of Jim Sarnier here in the program. Nice. Because uh, he is married to, uh, uh, or his sister is married to uh, Roberto Luongo. Right. He I go a uh, great Roberto. place, Heritage. Awesome. Oh, have you been there? Yeah. 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 Awesome place. All right. It's one of Mayo's favorites. So uh, I'm thinking hopefully we'll have as favorable an opinion, but we'll, we'll get down there soon. Uh, Jimmy John's is big chill and uh, take advantage of uh, all the good stuff that's going on there. Now, I, I don't know uh, if uh, because we've lost Luby and uh, people let us know here on the chat line if uh, you're still getting uh, uh, John and me here uh, on the program because we want to get in this dolphin thing. But I was going to throw it to a, a brief commercial break here. Uh, but I, I don't know if that's doable without uh, Luby showing up on the screen here. And let's go so, right into the Dolphins. Let's go right so, into So it. let's do it. Yeah, I mean, uh, let, let's assume that we aren't talking to the universe. That's the, you know, the thing about streaming. Uh, you know, am I on? Huh? <laughs> that happened to you uh, in uh, radio shows uh, oh, frequently? Oh, yeah. yeah where, Absolutely. Where you, all of a sudden, they, uh, you know, you get a text from somebody. Oh, okay. Yeah, Andy says we're fine. Which, you know, it's always good to know that he's fine as well because he, he's been struggling with a couple of things. But, uh, uh, all right, uh, a Dolphin game yesterday. Uh, how could you, uh, you know, I mean, be anything but satisfied with it, I, I would think. I, I know Luby had some, uh, you know, criticisms of McDaniel and decision-making. Seems like we go through that every week. 
Um, but I, I thought it was a pretty dynamic performance by the Miami Dolphins, and uh, I couldn't believe it. The, they uh, are um, out yarding through five games. A- any team, they're putting up more offensive yards than any team, I, I believe, through the first five games uh, of the season this year, any team in history. Yeah. Uh, think about it. They're putting up over 500 yards a game, John. That's, you know, if you had one 500-yard game, you'd say that that was significant. Yeah, and that includes, you know, the greatest show on turf, too, with the Rams. So, I... I Mike Martz, yeah. I mean, a maniac who was uh, putting up yards. Uh, yeah. Even in, you know, in games that he used, you know, had blowout margins in. I didn't think the Dolphins would be this explosive. I knew they would put points up on the board. I knew Tyreek Hill would, you know, is going to get his uh, five or six plays a game that's going to go. You're going to lean back and go, wow, that guy's fast. Yeah. But the speed of this football team and the way the offensive line has been able to get after it and get downfield and, and help with the running game, not only at the point of attack, but you don't have runs of 76 yards unless the receivers and the linemen are getting off their initial blocks and then getting to the second level and, and allowing the running backs to, to read those blocks and get there with a full head of speed. Speed. I mean, a Chan is is running. It takes him about three strides to get to full sp- speed. And when he hits it, he is gone. And all you yes. see the back of the jersey in 28 going, where did that guy go? And, uh, you know, that's his third game of 100 yards or more. And that hasn't happened since Jay Ajayi in 2016. You got Tyreek Hill going for 181. Two is over 300 yards again. I think he's done that. 10 times in his career now and multiple times this year, uh, you finally get um, a team that your defense could take advantage of. You know, you get seven sacks, you get 14 quarterback hits on Daniel, poor Daniel Jones, who I felt, excuse me, sorry for. Well, he got a while because, you know, he, his offensive line, I think that was the fifth offensive line set up for the New York giants through five weeks. And you can tell, I mean, it just. Well, who was the guy they had out there at left tackle? Began <clears throat> uh, his name began with an E. I you something, uh, and uh, he was just. Uh, let's see if they have it in here. He, he, he was horrendous. Yeah. Uh, not, uh, oh, sure uh, Izudu, <clears throat> right? Uh, Josh Izudu was just getting beaten like a drum. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't leave that guy out there. Well, Dave Van Ginkle, Van Ginkle looked enough. like he was running the rail like the rail on a on a sprint, you know, around the track. Yeah. He just he never broke stride. He went right around the tackle and you know on top of the quarterback and within a couple of seconds. So, you know, you get Sealer had two sacks. I think Ogba had a sack and a half. Van Ginkle was in on a sack. Christian Wilkins flashed all day, which was nice to see. So you had a, a bunch of different guys get in, but when you when you go back and watch the game, it's 14-10. You're going, how can it be 14-10? The Dolphins are completely dominating this game. Uh, in the second half, it was nice to see, to Luby's point earlier in the show, that uh, somebody took the, the play-calling sheet away from Mike McDaniel and just said, all you can do is call runs on this drive. All you can do is call runs. Because I think they scored in eight plays and seven of them were runs. Yeah. So it, it was nice to see they got back to kind of grinding it out because sometimes I, I think the Dolphins forget they have, they have so many uh, – so many options in the passing game. Like when they started the game, I, I think their first their first drive, they had three plays of over 20 yards, and they went bing, bing, bing. They, they went east and west, tired out the Giants' defense. Then they started hammering them north and south. Then you get you know a screenplay that goes for, what, 69 yards and, and a touchdown. So uh, there's so many options on this offense, you, you sometimes forget, oh, this kid, the rookie, ran for 100 yards – in three games straight, you know, he had 200 yards in one game, then he had 150 and then he had 102 or whatever it was. So you forget about that. And the offensive line and Ingold are pounding people. I mean, they're just, they're Ingold was, was terrific. And so was the rookie. I think the rookie, uh, what's his name? Brooks, or I, I can't remember the young running back that came in the game. I saw him go in at fullback and he was absolutely pounding people. So, it's nice to see, and now and now with Buffalo losing, it seemed like you know Buffalo loses, Baltimore loses, uh, you know all the teams you needed to kind of take a step back. 
took a step back. New England got pounded. Uh, they're done. You know, oh so the, the Dolphins are back in the driver's seat. And I think the Giants and Carolina have come at a great time because then they can go on to that stretch where they, they get Philly on the road. They go to Germany for Kansas City. You know, they have a couple of somebody in their weight class they're going to have to play in the next, you know, month and a month and a half. Yeah, I don't know how Mario lives that down. Obviously, he won't be fired. He will hold on to his job. Uh, they have two t- their two tough games are coming up with Carolina, Clemson, and then I think in a few weeks they play Florida State. This was supposed to be their easy introduction in the ACC. Had one of the easiest schedules in the country. Yes, Texas A&M was above 500. Yes, Texas A&M did play Alabama tough. Yes, Texas A&M may not be the team that won five games last year. But that was their toughest game. It wasn't like they played a top 10 team. And then they played three FCS teams. I mean, Miami's schedule was a freaking disaster. And I was waiting to see them in the ACC. They played like garbage. I mean, their, their defense was really good against Georgia Tech, but Georgia Tech isn't good offensively. And their offense was abysmal. Uh, Van Dyke went back to the ways we saw of him last year. And even at times the year before when he was a seemingly brewing star, three interceptions, they kept them... Kept that game tight. Georgia Tech had a late lead. Then UM ties it up. Then UM takes the lead on a field goal. And they did just enough to have the game wrapped up. And their coach, who did this in Oregon, Mario is known to be a a below average game day coach. He overthinks things. He does makes really bad decisions. I don't care if the offensive coordinator came up with this call. When you're the head coach, you know what the call is. And you say, no, no, we're good. We're kneeling. Once the clock's under 40 seconds and the other team has no timeouts, we kneel, game's over, you end the game. No, Mario overthought it. They did kneel, they ran it, they fumbled. And then with 26 seconds left, Georgia Tech with no timeouts, the game should have still been over. Miami allows them to get behind them. Miami loses in not only dramatic, but in sad, pathetic fashion. I mean, yeah, they've had some tough losses in Middle Tennessee State last year, FIU with Manny Diaz. They've lost the championship games. They've had tough, rough losses. A lot of people are calling this the worst, and it's because of how it happened. It literally shouldn't have been a loss. Just kneel. So we'll see. Mario did this exact thing in 2018 with Oregon. He did a lot of questionable things as head coach of Oregon. UM fans assumed he had learned. We'll see if he learns now. He took the blame, and I give him credit for taking the blame. But to me, if you don't learn from it, then who gives a shit if you take the blame? We'll see if he has learned from it. We'll see with the Canes uh, this weekend taking on a North Carolina team that's really coming into their own. Already had a really good offense. Now their defense may not be as good as the offense, but it's playing pretty good football. Good luck to UM this week, and then the following weekend, they take on Clemson. A lot going on in the world of sports. We talked touched on the Miami Dolphins there. Major League Baseball playoffs. The Marlins are now out. The Heat are in the middle of camp, opening up preseason. At, have just opened up preseason action. And the Panthers open up their season. So we will get to all of it. As you know, we love talking our local sports here on the Five Reasons Sports Network. Uh, check us out each and every morning on South Florida Live, the Default Show with Luby, both YouTube and and Facebook, check us out with our national podcast, The Believe Network, After Hours with Defoe and Luby, Believe, B-L-E-A-V dot com. We now do something each and every day on nofilter.net, nofilter.net, the morning briefing. But our South Florida skewed sports right here, The Devo Show with Luby on the Five Reasons Sports Network. From the newly renovated sports bar to the beautiful bayside views captured at the Tiki Bar, Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill has it all. Located at mile marker 104, the Big Chill also offers waterfront dining while experiencing breathtaking sunset views of the Florida Keys. It's simply the hottest spot in the Keys to cool off. That's Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill at mile marker 104 in Key Largo. For more information, call today at 305-453-9066. These days, we're all looking for comfort anywhere we can find it. Thank goodness for Land Lovers, Raw Bar and Grill in the plantation because they are making sure you are as comfortable as possible. First of all, they're not only open for delivery and pickup. All you have to do is go to landloversbarandgrill.com for both pickup and free delivery. You're going to have the best wings in the world. You're going to have a great burger. You're going to have their amazing soups. Again, Land Lovers, Raw Bar and Grill. It's nice and easy. Just go to landloversbarandgrill.com for both your pickup and free delivery. Thank goodness for Land Lovers for making you always feel right at home. Hey, folks, Tony Segreto here. Let me ask you a question. What do you look for when you go out to eat? Good food, obviously. Friendly atmosphere, not too loud, but good energy, reasonable prices, and a place where you feel comfortable. 
All those ingredients, <laughs> no pun meant there, are hard to find unless you're talking about the Texas Roadhouse. You see, they encompass all of those attributes. Really, really good food, amazing atmosphere, good for a family, good for a date, or just a night out for yourself, and prices that will make you extremely happy. Their ribs unmatched, steaks hand cut every day. Everything, and I mean everything, is made on site, including their incredible bread. It's the one day, folks, that you can forget about low-carb diets. Trust me when I tell you, Texas Roadhouse, your restaurant, your destination, when you say, where should we go and eat tonight? 